Welcome to What Does the Bible Teach with Pastor Joshua Olivares. I am Jamie, and in today's episode, we will be discussing the perseverance of the saints. What is this important doctrine? And how does this help us understand the assurance of our salvation? Can a born-again, spirit-filled, spirit-sealed, blood-bought Christian lose their salvation? And lastly, how can we be sure that our salvation is eternally secure in Christ? So without further ado, Pastor Josh, what does the Bible teach? Thank you, Jamie. Now, the perseverance of the saints is a doctrine that is also best known as the doctrine of eternal security, the preservation of the saints, or one saved, always saved. And before I explain what this doctrine teaches, I would like to begin by listing down what this doctrine does not teach. Number one, this doctrine does not teach that the sinner who has been saved by the grace of God may continue in a rampant lifestyle of sin, enjoying lawlessness, and still expect to be saved no matter what, which is a clear violation of the Word of God according to 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 and 10, and 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, where the Bible teaches us, By this we know that we have come to know Him, If we keep his commandments, the one who says I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Number two, this doctrine does not teach that the believer out of his own strength and will is the reason to why he perseveres to the very end which is clearly refuted by Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 where the Bible teaches us, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. So we see here, it was God that began that good work of salvation and not us. And therefore, God who began the work will also complete the work that he started to completion. So having now cleared up some of the misconceptions concerning eternal security, let us now then proceed in understanding what this doctrine really teaches. The perseverance of the saints is a doctrine that emphasizes on the sovereignty of God's power and love in preserving His redeemed people to the very end. And we see this in the book of John chapter 10, verses 27 to 30, where the Bible teaches us, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now when Christ says, I and the Father are one, The context here is speaking of essence and unity in protecting and keeping the sheep from falling away or being snatched out of God's hands. And because it is the Father and the Son who keeps the sheep from perishing, we then see the reason to why Christ says in verse 28, And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. Now, the words never perish in verse 28 will answer the question that was asked earlier. Can a born-again, spirit-filled, spirit-sealed, blood-bought believer lose their salvation? Now, the word never that is used in this passage is from the Greek word ou. And this word ou is an absolute negative And this Greek word is connected to another Greek word known as ume. And ume is a double negative, which is the strongest way of saying it will never or by no means nor ever will in the Greek language. So ume is strengthening the denial of something. And the denial in verse 28 is to cause the sheep from ever perishing. So this teaches us that once the sinner is called to salvation by Christ, they are then kept by God's power in preserving their souls from falling away 
and therefore never losing their salvation. And this is something that we see all throughout the Bible. Matter of fact, here in Psalm chapter 97, verse 10, the Bible teaches us, Hate evil, you who love the Lord, who preserves the souls of his godly ones. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Then in Psalm 23, verse 6, Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Then in John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Then in John chapter 6, verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. Then here in Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 29, For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom He predestined, He also called. And these whom He called, He also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. So those who are chosen are guaranteed to final salvation. Then here in verses 31 to 39, the Bible teaches us, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So saints are never going to be separated from Christ according to these passages. Then in Ephesians chapter 1, starting at verse 13, the Bible teaches us, In Him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. Now, the word sealed that is used in verse 13 is from the Greek word sfragizo, and this Greek word is a stamp, signet, or private mark for security or preservation. And when this Greek word is used in the New Testament, number one, it speaks of a guaranteed salvation seal from the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting at verse 21, the Bible teaches us, 
Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Then in Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 30, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And secondly, when sfragizo is used, it speaks of a guaranteed divine protection from God. According to Revelation chapter 7, starting at verse 1, After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So in short, when the Bible says in Ephesians 1 verses 13 and 14 that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise to the redemption of God's own possession, as a shepherd stamps and calls his sheep by name, likewise, Christ, the good shepherd, stamps and calls out his sheep through the Holy Spirit by sealing their salvation forever. Now, as we come back in dealing with the passages that address eternal security, the Bible teaches us here in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 24 and 25, but Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And the reason why Christ is able to save them forever through means of intercession is because he holds forever the position of heavenly high priest, which is seen also in John chapter 17, verse 12. Now, another passage that deals with eternal security is found here in 1 Peter chapter 1, starting at verses 3 and 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Then in Jude verses 24 and 25, the Bible teaches us, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So the word to keep would not be any different from what Paul had declared in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 6 and 9, where the Bible teaches us, Even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, waiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, having now addressed the passages that deal with eternal security, one might ask, 
What about the warning passages in the Bible that seem to imply that Christians could lose their salvation? Well, the best way to answer this is by carefully examining these passages in their proper context. So let's begin by examining Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. The Bible teaches us, Again, when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I place an obstacle before him, he will die. Since you have not warned him, he shall die in his sin. And his righteous deeds, which he has done, shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. However, if you have warned the righteous man that the righteous should not sin and he does not sin, he shall surely live because he took warning and you have delivered yourself. Now, the context of these passages is dealing primarily with the weighty responsibility of a prophet that if he fails to give warning to the wicked or righteous man, they will die and their blood will be held against the prophet of God. Now, the usage of life and death in verses 20 and 21 is to be understood as physical rather than eternal because the Old Testament was primarily under the Mosaic Covenant, which focused on the physical and therefore to disobey God under the law would lead to physical death or shortening of life as seen in Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 15 to 20, which then would conclude that the warnings in verses 20 and 21 is not speaking of losing one's salvation, but rather God who is holy will treat the righteous the same way he would treat the wicked when we break his law. For God is no respecter of any persons. For salvation is always by faith and never by works of any kind. Now, if we turn here to Matthew chapter 7, starting at verses 21 and 23, the Bible teaches us, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, who is in heaven, will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, many suggest that these are claims from true Christians who lost their salvation. However, the trait or characteristic of a true believer is to do the will of the Father, as seen in verse 21, to which they did not do. Secondly, we know they were not true converts is because Jesus said in verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And the two key words that prove they were not true believers are the words knew and practice. Now, if these individuals were truly saved, then Christ would have known them from a relationship standpoint, as seen in John 10, verse 27, where the Bible teaches us, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. However, because they were false, he tells them that he never knew them. Now, for the word practice, we know that these were false converts due to what we see in 1 John chapter 3, starting at verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children... Make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. 
No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So it is abundantly clear that these who claim to know the Lord were in fact false converts who accepted the routines of religion superficially and not Christ sincerely. Now, moving on to another passage, here in John chapter 15, starting at verses 1 to 6, the Bible teaches us, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that he may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, the context of John 15 is Christ encouraging his chosen disciples to abide in him, because anyone who was truly connected to Christ and is connected to Christ would never be or could ever be fruitless. And therefore, fruitless branches symbolizes false converts and are severed in verses 2 and 6. Now, as we examine another passage in the Bible, here in Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 12, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, the phrase, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, does not mean that the Christian is to earn his salvation by works or else he loses it. Nor does this mean we always have to live in panic and alarm. But rather, the words work out in the Greek is a verb that addresses to fulfill or bring about to completion. Therefore, the proper interpretation of this passage is to demonstrate your salvation by living a sanctified life as a way of showing your respect and honor to God. Now, as we continue more on the rest of the other warning passages in the Bible on next time's podcast, if you have any questions concerning about today's episode or questions about the Bible in general, kindly let us know. And we will do what we can to answer your questions on this podcast, What Does the Bible Teach? This is Brother Joshua Olivares, just wanting to gladly remind you that Jesus Christ is God.